And we've been in a series in the book of Jonah, and and today we're wrapping up the book of Jonah in Jonah chapter 4. I have loved hearing stories from people about how God is moving in your life, how God is leading you to quit running, to turn back to him, to quit running, to follow him. The story of Jonah has really resonated with a lot of people, uh, which makes sense because it absolutely resonates with me. So let's look at Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, as we come to the last chapter in Jonah. I hope we miss our friend Jonah next week. We're going to miss him, but we've been in his life a little bit. Jonah 4.1 says this, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, very wrong, and he became angry. And, and you might think, you know, if you're like me, what, what's going on? Like, this is the end of Jonah, right? Like, isn't this the last chapter in Jonah? By now, Shouldn't he be okay? Like, by now, shouldn't he be happy? By now, shouldn't things be kind of up and to the right in his life? Like, you can't come to the end of it, and he's still angry and ticked off. It it reminds me about uh, uh, one time at camp where where I would lead. I'd gone there for a few years uh, as a leader. Started, like, late high school into college. And the first few years of camp, and, and our students have gone to camp recently, the camps that I went to as a child, uh, as a student, were not like the ones you went to. We were missing some things that you guys had, like fun and friendship, right? We didn't have those things. We had Bible study, worship, you know, service, Bible study, worship, service, I mean, that's all, prayer meeting, it's all we had. And so the last day of camp was always on a Sunday morning, and this kind of community of churches that would go to this camp, we were accustomed to testimony time on a Sunday in church. Some of you know testimony time. And And so on Sunday morning, the last day of camp, people would give up and and they would testify about the way, and I'm giving away a little bit of my Christian background here for those of you who know, right? They would testify about how God had moved in their life at camp, the amazing things God had done in their camp. And they'd be like, oh, my life has changed. I'm going to be a new person and everything's different. And that's beautiful. And and that's what we pray for. And that's what we hope for. And and every student would get up and give a story like that. Uh, But after a couple years of leading, one of my, you know, one of the guys that I would lead with, his name is Stephen. I remember remember he got up the last day of camp Sunday morning and he went up there and he's like listen guys I've been here for a couple years and you guys always come up here and tell me your lives are changed and then next year you come back and then you say the same thing again and you go back and you do the same stuff and you have the same struggles I just want you to know life is still going to be tough and you're still going to struggle even after you leave camp and we're all sitting there like, what are you doing, Stephen? Like, that's not what you're supposed to say to that, right? Like, what are you doing? We're supposed to be talking about how, like, how do you keep the spiritual high going? Which even that's weird, because that's like about drugs. But that's how we would talk, right? Like, how do you keep this going? But, but Stephen was honest. He's like, listen, you're going to go back to your real life. You're going to go back to school. You're going to go back to your friends. And, and if you struggled, like, there's still going to be a lot of stuff that's a struggle. And there's still going to be a lot of stuff that is hard, See, scholars don't know exactly who wrote the book of Jonah. Most believe that it's Jonah himself. And he's looking back over the season in his life, and and, and he's writing what he went through in that season in his life. Jonah chapter 4 is there as a gift to us. It's a gift from Jonah, and as God inspires Jonah to write, it is a gift from God. Because if you've ever been through a time in your life where you feel like and everyone around you feels like and everyone is just telling you, like, I feel like by now you should be happy. I feel like by now you should have this figured out. I feel like by now you should no longer be struggling. If you've ever been there, but you're like, but I'm still struggling. It's still hard. I still have questions. There's still stuff that I'm walking through and that I'm dealing with. Jonah chapter 4 is a gift because it helps us know that God understands, that God sees, and that God is with us even in that. I'm among those people that believe Jonah is the one who wrote these words. I love biographies. Uh, and, And biographies are usually authored by people who saw their subject as like their hero. So when you read a biography, you're like, man, here's this guy talking about someone in the Civil War, but is, it's as if Jesus was in the Civil War. Like, that's how they write about them, right? They're their heroes. But when you read autobiographies written by the actual people, all of a sudden, it's very raw, it's very real, because they know everything that's going on in their heart. They know what they're walking through, what they're dealing with, and I think that's what we see in Jonah that someone who truly is struggling is telling you about his story and what it is like for him to follow God. So chapter four begins, Jonah is still struggling. 
even after the grace of God has changed him, even after God has used him by his grace to change other people, Jonah is still struggling. He's kind of been struggling all the way through this book. Right? Every week, Jonah has been in a little bit of a struggle, which begs the question, what's the problem, Jonah? Like, what's going on? What are you dealing with? So let's go back. Jonah chapter 3, verses 6 to 9. We didn't look at these verses last week. Remember, he preaches eight words to the people of Nineveh in English, five words in Hebrew. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. And the city repents. But this repentance goes all the way to the top. We read in verse 6, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Remember, sackcloth, it's this uncomfortable, itchy material. It is a sign of, of humility. It's a sign that they're ready to get uncomfortable. And then the king makes this proclamation. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste Anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on the Lord. I mean, I mean, he's saying, let's declare a fast. Let's sit in sackcloth. Let's fast. And remember, this is a pagan culture. They don't follow the God of Jonah. So it's like, I love it. The king doesn't really even know like how to fast. He's like, let's fast. So people don't eat. Uh, animals don't eat. I guess that's how you fast. Like he's, he's figuring it out as he's going too. Nobody eat anything. And I love the humility because he's like, listen, if, if Jonah's words are true, we're going to take this seriously. People don't eat. Animals don't eat. Put on sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Remember, Nineveh was defined by their arrogance and their violence. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. And then look at this. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Who knows is so powerful coming from the king of Nineveh the capital of Assyria, the most powerful nation on earth at the time. See, the words of Jonah come, and when true repentance comes to the heart of the people and to the heart of the king, the king is like, I cannot control the Almighty. Who knows? We're going to follow, we're going to repent, we're going to go after him, we're going to be faithful, and he's still sovereign. He is still in control. He says, who knows? Maybe he will relent. Maybe he will have compassion on us. It's the show of reverence, a healthy fear of God, a show of worship, a show of awe, a show of humility. Then look at Jonah 3.10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. And we're like, that's amazing. That's awesome. Yay, God. It's what everybody's been praying for. It's what everybody's been hoping for. But look again at Jonah's response. Jonah 4.1. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. That's what he's mad about. He is mad that the people of Nineveh have repented. He is mad that God who once proclaimed punishment on them, has now relented and will show his compassion, his mercy, and forgiveness to them. That's why he's mad. Look at Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. And, and now you see kind of what's been going on the whole time. Everything that we've looked at in the life of Jonah, what is the impetus for it? Jonah prayed. Now, this is only the second time in this book that he's prayed. One time he prayed in the belly of the fish. Right? He called upon the Lord. The Lord answered him. Now he prays again. Jonah, he prayed to the Lord. And this is crazy. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew this was going to happen. This is what I said. This is the reason I didn't want to do what you called me to do in the first place, God. 
I tried to get away. I tried to run to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God. Now he's quoting from Exodus. This is beautiful, beautiful literature for the people of Israel that Moses declares over them at a time when the people of Israel are going to be judged and punished by God. But God again relents in their repentance and he does not judge the people of Israel in that moment as Moses worships. This is what he says. We see the character, the nature of God revealed. Now Jonah is quoting those same words. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God. Notice this. The very thing that Moses sees as as a worship-worthy character of God, Jonah is seeing as a bad thing. I knew this is how you were. You are gracious and compassionate, God, slow to anger and abounding in love. In love. That word is chesed. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. The chesed, the loving kindness, the loyalty, the faithfulness of God that has saved Jonah. And now he's like, I don't want that for them. I knew that you were abounding in love, a God who relents from sending Calamity. Another word we're familiar with in this, Ra, we talked about the first week, the eve of the calamity that the people of Nineveh had committed that would bring God's judgment on them. Now it's saying they've been delivered from that. Now, Lord, take away my life for it. It's better for me to die than to live. Jonah's like, I would rather die than see the people of Nineveh saved. I mean, this is what's going on. This is what's been going on in his heart the whole time. Jonah is not afraid of public speaking. Jonah is not afraid of of the city of blood and their arrogance and their violence. Jonah is not worried about how they'll react to his words when he gets there. Jonah is honest. God, you called me to go there. And the reason I ran is because I hate them. And I know how you are, God. I know you're compassionate and gracious. And I thought to myself, what if I go there? And I preach the gospel, I preach the good news of God, and they repent, and he doesn't punish them. He can't fathom that. He can't stand that. There's a part of him that's like, that's not fair. That's how God works. There's a part of Jonah that would say, I want grace for me, not for them. I want mercy for me. This whole book is about how God has been so merciful to Jonah. As Jonah ran away from God, as Jonah rebelled, and God in his mercy goes after him. God sends a storm, God sends a fish, God sends all these different things to bring Jonah back on track, bring him back on the path that would lead him to life and flourishing as he walks in faithfulness and obedience to the commands of God. God has been pursuing him and going after him. Jonah's like, I want his mercy for me, but not for them. Now, why does Jonah hate the people of Nineveh so much. In some way, he's looking back on what has happened, and he is looking forward on what he thinks might happen. He's looking back. The people of Assyria had actually come in, and they had overrun the people of Israel. They had taken many of them captive as exiles. And in order to win back their freedom, the Israelites had to pay tribute. And and tribute is not just like, hey, pay us some taxes or pay us some money. Tribute was the Assyrians were allowed to go into Israel, and it was like, you could take whatever you want. And so they would walk into towns and villages, and if it was kids or women or things or money or, or, or riches or treasure, whatever it is, they could take whatever they want. And Jonah's aware of this. Maybe he knows people who've lived through this. And Jonah's like, I remember what these people did. They hurt us badly. I remember what we have endured. I remember that part of our history. He's also looking forward. He's got contemporaries like Hosea. Hosea prophesies of Israel that if they will not repent, if they will not turn away from their evil and follow the Lord, one of the punishments that could befall them is that the Assyrians would come in and again take over the nation of Israel. So he's looking to the future like these guys might come and they might hurt us in the future. In the past I've been hurt by these people. In the future, we might be hurt by these people. God, why would you want to save these people? God, why do you want to work in their lives? For Jonah, God telling Jonah to go and preach in Nineveh would be like telling a survivor of a concentration camp to go and tell Nazis about God's grace and mercy 
than his faithfulness. It, it would be like telling a, an African American growing up in Mississippi who endured the brutality of racism in the 50s and 60s to go back into those places and preach to members of the KKK. It doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't make sense to us. So the Lord replied in verse four, is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? Is it right for you to be angry? And remember, there's, there's a lot of humor actually in the way that this is written for us in the original Hebrew language, so don't miss the humor. It's really serious, but it's kind of written in a way that is humorous so that we see the nature of God in it. Do you say, Jonah, should you feel this way? And I wonder if God's kind of like, hey man, do you remember like everything that's happened in your life, in recent history? Is it good for you to be angry? But Jonah's not even hearing it. He basically storms off like a child, right? He's like, Jonah had already gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter. He makes himself something like maybe a lean-to against a tree. He gets some shade. He sat down in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. And most scholars interpret this, this verse as Jonah goes somewhere where he's high up. He can see the city of Nineveh. He builds some shade for himself, and he sits and he watches and deep in his heart, he's probably hoping, God, maybe you'll still punish them. Like, literally, maybe I can sit here and watch the city burn. Again, what is his problem? What's going on in Jonah's heart? He has a problem with love. He has a problem with love. Again, mercy for me, not for them. There's a study done by the American Bar Association uh, that shows through a huge survey, uh, nine out of 10 people, about 89% of Americans say that we are less civil today than we were 10 years ago. And I know what you're all thinking, why waste money on this study? Like, we could all just tell you that right now, right? Just give me the money. I will tell you that is absolutely true. It's absolutely true. We're less civil than we ever were, but also we're finding how often incivility leads to hostility. And when incivility leads to hostility, we begin to dehumanize other people. We begin to hate other people. Not just, I disagree with you, I want you gone. I want to sit up on my perch and I want to watch your city burn. Maybe God just maybe God will bring down his fire on the city. That's what Jonah's hoping. And the, the holiness of God is real. The judgment of God is real. But God has also called Jonah to go in and make a difference in the lives of those who he possibly can. That's why God pronounces his judgment in advance. We talked about this last week because it's the last thing he wants to do. And so he sends Jonah, go. Yes, the people are running away from me. Yes, the people of Nineveh, they are violent. They are arrogant. They do have problems. Go and tell them about me. Show them a different way. And so he tries to send him, but the incivility turns to hostility. So what does God do with people like that? Because some of us can feel that way. Some of us can be that way. What does God do with people like that? Is he just like, Jonah, you're done. You had your shot. Get out of here. It's Hosea's turn now. Bring him in because Jonah is worthless. No, God's going to teach him. God's going to grow him. God's going to make him better. And in this instant, he does it with like a, a miraculous object lesson. That's how it works. So we go to Jonah chapter 4, verse 6. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And we can actually understand what this is kind of like, right? Because we live in Oklahoma, and it's June in Oklahoma, and some of you are like, God, send a leafy plant right now to give me some comfort, right? So Jonah gets this leafy plant to provide shade. And Jonah was, look at this, Jonah was very happy about the plant. Please notice We've been studying Jonah's life for four weeks. For one month, we've been looking at Jonah's life. It is the first time that he's been very happy. It's the first time he's been happy, period. Forget the very, right? Exceedingly happy in Hebrew. It's the first time he's been happy. The plant is the first thing that's caused him to be like, you know what, maybe things aren't so bad. The plant has made him very happy. But God's trying to teach him something, 
And, and I'm telling you, this is how he works in a lot of our lives. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, and it gets worse, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And again, Jonah's like, I, I just want to die. He wanted to die. And he said, it would be better for me not to live. Now, some of you might be like, I don't, why is the plant such a big deal? Right? I don't get that happy about plants. But God does often teach us what it means to follow him and what it means to do what he's called us to do with our, you could call them our, our, our creature comforts. And, and that's what he's getting at here with Jonah. You can insert whatever creature comfort you love. It might be your car. It might be your boat, your favorite sport, your clothes, your gaming system, your comfort, your leisure, whatever it is. God is using that to show Jonah what really matters to him compared to what really matters to God. Are you with me? This often happens to me. It's the most annoying thing about being a pastor. I got to teach on something on Sunday. And so sometime during the week, God makes me live it out, right? I hate it. I hate it, but it always happens. Yesterday, I go to a, a coffee shop that I, I enjoy going to on Saturdays because it kind of lets me kind of get my thoughts together. And I have two kids at home. So I got to get my thoughts together and, and get ready for today. So I go to this coffee shop that I like yesterday. Um, I'm sitting there. I'm working. I've only been there for like five minutes. And, and it's full. It's packed. For some reason, everybody is at the coffee shop. There's children there. They don't drink coffee. Why are they there? But like, I'm like... <laughs> I had kids at home, right? I mean, why are your kids here? No offense to people who take kids to coffee shops. So this lady walks in, and, and she's by herself. She's got two little kids, and there's nowhere to sit, right? And I was like, ah, oh, man, I don't want them to have a terrible time. So I'm like, you, you can sit here. I'm a pastor. Norman, please come to the Bible church. I'm giving you my seat. Come to our church. No. And so I, I let her sit there, and there's nowhere to sit, right? So I go sit outside, thinking I'm just going to sit outside for a little bit. I'm out there for like three minutes, and I'm like, it is hot in Oklahoma. Like, what was I thinking? I should have stayed in there. I should have made her sit out here, right? Like, it's hot. And so immediately, as I'm, I'm, I'm looking over these words that I'm sharing with you, like, I don't have any creature comforts, whatever. I'm like, oh, it's AC. Like, who knew? AC <laughs> is what it is for me. I'm hot right now. And, and, and coffee, my lovely coffee shop. That's the other thing that is kind of a creature comfort for me. I kid you not, I can't make this stuff up. I'm sitting there, I'm writing this, getting ready for you. I hear two people just cussing at each other behind me, absolutely cussing at each other. I'm like, what is going on? I turn around, there's a fist fight happening behind me. Two guys are just slugging it out. Cars are honking at them. I'm like, what good is honking doing, people? Like, you know, someone, <laughs> someone else, go help them, right? Like, so I'm busy, I gotta write a message. <laughs> and so I see them, I see them. And, and sure enough, one of them walks up to me and he's like, hey, man. I was like, God, <laughs> what, what is this? Hey, sir. And I said, I, nothing else came to mind. I said, seems like you're having a bad day. Right? I didn't know what to say. <laughs> seems like you're having a bad day. Saw that whole thing. What's going on? You know, and he's just like, what are you doing? And what do I, I gotta be like, I'm writing a sermon, right? So let's, let's talk. So I talked to him. And he is having a bad day. He just got in a fist fight with his friend in the coffee shop parking lot. That's not a good day. But he's going through a lot of hard things. It's been difficult. We have a good conversation. I told him I'll pray for him. I was like, you want me to pray for you right now? He's like, no, that's weird. But he's like, pray for me later. And he walks away. I'm like, all right, great. Lord, extra points, right? Mansion in heaven, all that good stuff. I go inside. Now there's room for me to sit inside. I go inside. I sit down. Again, I can't make this stuff up. Uh, I'm by myself. Everybody else is kind of like in groups there. I'm by myself. So this guy comes up to me and he's like, hey, uh, I need to plug my phone in. It would be okay if I sit here. And I'm like, that's great. No problem, man. He sits down. Like a minute after he sits down, he starts talking to himself very loudly, right? Just conspiracy theories, all this stuff. Just talking to himself. I was like, what have I done? Like, God, what is... <laughs> What do you want, right? And so I'm just asking him questions like, oh, man, I, the soil is polluted. I know, I know. Like, so tell me more about it. Like, why, well, what do you think that is? So I'm sharing my faith with him because I'm like, God wants me to love people. Clearly, like, God wants me to love people. I'm sharing my faith with him. That conversation went nowhere, right? I mean, I knew I was barking up the wrong tree, but I, I had this responsibility to talk to him. Uh, and, and he left. That's the amazing thing is somehow... I scared him <laughs> more than he scared me. So he left. And I'm just sitting there thinking. And, and, but what, what I found out is, man, I'm, I'm in this place where I feel like, oh, I live in such a comfortable place. 
right? Oh, I live in a nice part of town. I'm at my nice coffee shop. My life is easy. It's comfortable. It's good. And God brings across my path two people who are struggling. And I felt like God in that moment was reminding me by, by taking away some of my creature comforts. Like, hey, Jason, there's people that are really important to me. And you can get so caught up in your shade, in your plant, you can get so caught up in the things that make life easy and make life comfortable that you forget about the people that matter to me. I had two really good conversations yesterday that I could have easily seen. And you know what? Honestly, if I wasn't writing this message, maybe I would think of them as an inconvenience. But because of this, I felt like God was showing me something. What is it for you? What is it for you? So God gives him something that brings him comfort, this leafy plant that gives him shade. And he's like, oh, I love the shade. And then God sends a worm to eat the plant. And and notice this, throughout the book of Jonah, have you seen this? Everything and everyone listens to God except the man of God, (laughs) right? Like, man, like from the beginning, Jonah, go to Nineveh. No, he won't listen. The storms will listen to God. The fish will listen to God. Pagan sailors will listen to God. Captains of ships are listening to God. The Ninevites are listening to God. The king of Nineveh is listening to God. Worms are listening to God. The wind is listening to God. The sun is listening to God. Everybody but Jonah. <laughs> Jonah is like, no, 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 no. Whatever you say, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. So the plant dies. God says in verse 9, God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? God's like, you're answering this question. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? This time, Jonah answers, it is. It is right for me to be angry about the plant. And I'm so angry, I wish I wasn't here anymore. It is right for me to be angry about the plant. God sets a trap. God sends some bait. And Jonah takes the bait. Because now God is like, okay. Verse 10, but the Lord said to him, you have been concerned about this plant Though you did not tend to it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are people, more than 120,000 people, who cannot tell their right hand from their left? And also, many animals, which is a random way to end the book of Jonah. But that's what God says. It's like God is pleading with the prophet, Jonah. You're so angry about this plant. I caused it to grow. I caused it to die. I did everything for this plant. You're so angry about the plant. Jonah, shouldn't I be concerned, passionate? Shouldn't I be concerned about the people that live in Nineveh? Shouldn't I be more concerned over their lives than you are about this plant? And through that, God is saying, Jonah, shouldn't you? Be more concerned with the people of Nineveh than you are for this plant. And I think the way God is doing it is, Jonah, even if you don't like the people, what about the animals? At least the donkeys. Will you go to Nineveh to save the donkeys? Like, is there anything, Jonah, that you can love in Nineveh? See, the point of this is sometimes God calls us to love people who seem unlovable. The very people that have hurt Jonah in the past, he thinks they might hurt me in the future. And God says, in this moment, how can you love them? I'm not telling you you to to, to become a doormat and let people use and abuse you. That's not what I'm saying. I hope you hear what I'm saying. There are people in your life that you would deem as unlovable. Because we love to, to walk in us versus them scenarios. Everything is us versus them. Whether it's your politics, whether it's your ideologies, whether it's your beliefs, whatever it is, everything is us versus them. And there's some people that we just want to write off. Anybody but them, God. You can save anybody but UT fans. No, I'm just kidding. That's fine. But, like, <laughs> but us versus them. We, we thrive on that. We live in that. People make money off of that. How can we love those that we might consider unlovable? Here's what we learned from Jonah. Three things real quick. Remember that they are created in God's image. He says, I caused this plant to grow. I created these people. They are mine. They bear my image, Jonah, so you must love them. Dr. John Perkins was a great leader in our faith, taught at Seattle Pacific University. He grew up in Mississippi and just endured the hardships of racism most of his life. 
And it got so hard, so difficult that he left. He's like, I cannot live here. So he moved to L.A. And when he moved to L.A., his son was saved at a local church there in Los Angeles. And after his son came to faith, Dr. John Perkins also was just like, what is this church about? What is this thing about? So he would go with his son to church. And John Perkins gave his life to Jesus. And when he gave his life to Jesus, he felt a call to ministry and an undeniable call to go back to Mississippi and preach the gospel to his people there in Mississippi. So he went back and he preached the gospel. And along with preaching the gospel, he, he tried to, to improve and, and move forward the civil rights movement there in Mississippi, which, which people hated that that's what he was doing. And so one day, him and a group of pastors, as they were leaving a church service, they were attacked by a group of police, beaten, brutally beaten, and thrown in jail. And, and in his book, Injustice for All, Dr. Perkins writes, I remember seeing the look on these men's faces. And he writes this, I remember seeing what hate had done to them. And he wrote with empathy and compassion, and these men were so impoverished. These men felt like failures. These men felt like they had no value or worth. And so beating up on other people who they deemed to be lesser than them, that's what made them feel important in that moment. And he somehow was able to look past the brutality that had happened to him and see that these were people created in the image of God, but hate had changed them. Hate had hijacked their hearts in some way. And so in that jail cell, he made the decision. He said, I'm going to preach the gospel in Mississippi, but I'm no longer just going to preach it to my people. I'm going to preach the gospel to all people. And eventually, Dr. Perkins would write a book with a former member of the KKK. He went into places where there were people where he could have easily said, I'm supposed to hate those people. I have the right to hate those people. But he worked to save those people in the name of Jesus, made great advancements for racial reconciliation in Mississippi and throughout the South in those days. Who is God calling you to? Who do you feel is unworthy to receive the love, the compassion, the grace of God? He's slow to anger. He is not lacking anything. He is good, he is gracious, and he's calling you to go to people that you might not feel like going to. The second thing is this, Remember that they don't know God many times. That's what he says, Jonah. Jonah, there's a city of 120,000 people, and, and they don't know their right hand from their left. What God is saying is they don't know me, Jonah. How do we expect unbelievers to believe what we believe, right? I, I think we do that often in the church. Where, where, where we're surprised that people who don't believe in God act as if they don't believe in God. Why is that surprising? Why is that surprising? And we write people off and we're like, not them, anybody but them. They don't know God. And so the people of Nineveh, it's like, Jonah, they, don't, they, they know arrogance, they know violence, that's all they know. Go and tell them about a God who is compassionate and gracious and slow to anger. Go and tell them about a God who's full of empathy and grace and mercy. Go and tell them about me. That will change the city. Remember that they don't know God. And finally, I think what God is saying to Jonah is remember that you have been shown grace. Jonah, Jonah, you ran from me. And I didn't give up on you. I didn't quit on you. I came after you. Has said loving kindness, faithfulness, loyalty. I chased you down with a storm. With a, I did everything I could, Jonah, to get you back to me to get you walking with me again, to get you to walk in life and abundance and flourishing. Do not forget, Jonah, but you have been forgiven much. Do not forget the grace that you have been shown. Jonah would say, mercy for me, but not for them. And God would say, the mercy that you have been shown is the mercy that they also must see in your life. Grace shown must be grace known by others. Corey Ten Boom is another story that I want to end with as we close out this book of Jonah. Corey Ten Boom is well known as an author, a leader, a speaker in her day. Um, she was of Dutch origin. Her family lived in the Netherlands. And, and in World War II, when the Nazis moved into the Netherlands, her family 
would hide Jewish people in their home to save their lives. The Nazis found out about this, so her and her whole family, when she was young and her sister was young, her whole family is thrown into a concentration camp called Ravensbrück. She survived, her sister did not survive. She survived, other members of her family did not survive. But she was radically saved by God, and then she went around the world preaching the gospel to people. Especially preaching about the power of forgiveness because she had endured extreme hate and pain at the hands of others. One day she was in Munich, Germany, and she preaches a message on forgiveness. And in her book, she actually writes that the, that the people in Germany at that time, they, they even had trouble dealing with the idea that God could forgive them. They felt so much guilt and so much shame because of their history. And after her message on forgiveness that day in Munich, one man started walking down the aisle of the auditorium where she had just spoken. And she recognized him. She knew his face immediately. He was one of the guards at Ravenbrook when she was there and her family was there. I'm just gonna read to you what she wrote. And I want you to think like Jonah. Who is it that God might be calling you to? She writes this, I remembered him. His face and the leather crop that he would swing from his belt. Now I was face to face with one of my captors and my blood froze. He spoke first. That was a fine message, ma'am. How good it is to know, as you say, our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And he extended his hand to me, but I could not take it. I, who had just spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled with my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He said, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. I was actually a guard there. But since then, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did. Ma'am, can you forgive me? And he extended his hand again. And as I stood there, I, whose sins had again and again been forgiven, I could not forgive him. My sister died in that place. It could not have been many seconds, but as he stood there, it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing that I had to do. I had to do it. I knew it. Not only as a command from God, but as a daily experience. I prayed silently, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand, but you must supply the feeling. So wooden and mechanically, I thrust my hand for the hand stretched out before me, and as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and a healing warmth flooded my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I said, I forgive you, brother. And for a long moment, we just stood there grasping each other's hands. Former guard, former prisoner. I never knew the love of God as intensely as I did then. Even so, I know it was not my love. I did not have the power, but it was the Holy Spirit of God in me. And the question is, who would you write off? Who would you say, God, mercy for me, but not for them? Jonah, I believe here, has been brutally honest with us didn't make himself out to be a saint or a hero. He's been brutally honest so that we could learn the way that we will glorify God in this world is to love radically, to stand firmly on our convictions, but to love radically in a way that only the Holy Spirit can empower us to do. In such contrast to this uncivil and hostile world that people would look to the people of God and say there's something so different about them that what they preach can only be true. We are Jonah. We are Jonah when we run. We're Jonah when we rebel. We're Jonah when we cry out in repentance for forgiveness. We are Jonah when we hate people who have hurt us, 
when we hate people who might cause us to fear, we are Jonah. We are Jonah. But we are also Jonah when we experience the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. And those who know grace must show grace. That is what will change the world as the message of the gospel permeates every place where you go. Amen? Let's pray together.